This is Dan Schneider. On this Dan Schneider video interview, Ludwig Wittgenstein is the topic, and I have two experts on him, and we will be talking about his life and his ideas, and that will begin in a moment. Continuing my series on major philosophers, Ludwig Wittgenstein is the subject this time. On the left of the screen is James Klager. Is it Klager? Oh. Yes. And on the right, Alfred Nordman. Let me begin by asking both of them a little bit about themselves, their views on Wittgenstein, what drew them to the work, anything they've written, that sort of thing. So let me uh, start with you, James. Okay, well, thank you for uh, doing this. Uh, it was an amazing coincidence that Alfred and I ended up being on the show at the same time. You said it was a, a coincidence anyway, because he and I have uh, co co edited two fairly important collections of material on Wittgenstein and have known each other for, um, well, maybe 30 years or close to 30 years anyway, <laughs> yeah. and have worked on Wittgenstein together for a long time. Um, I first took a class on Wittgenstein when I was an undergraduate in 1975, so I've had it, what, over 40 years now. And um, when I went to graduate school, uh, it didn't seem like doing uh, a dissertation on Wittgenstein was a, uh, a very profitable uh, course of action because it's not the sort of specialty you get a job in. So I, well, I was interested at that time in logic and the uh, uh, philosophy of language, uh, but m my interest kind of evolved in graduate school and I did a dissertation on moral realism at UCLA. But while I was there, there were uh, people interested in Wittgenstein. Uh, Rogers Albright and Philippa Foote, who uh, I've enjoyed attending their seminars. Um, when I got a job, I was working on tenure, and again, I did. Uh, I, I published primarily on things connected with supervenience and moral realism, and in general, topics in moral philosophy and metaphysics. But I always had an interest in Wittgenstein in the back of my mind, and so. Um, around the late 80s, um, I, I started indulging that interest, and really that's pretty much dominated my work since then. Uh, let me ask the same of Alfred, then, if you could give a little bit of background about yourself, anything you've written about Wittgenstein, and what drew you to him. Yeah, I'll, I'm a little different from Jim in the sense that I can't say that the work on Wittgenstein has sort of dominated my interest, even though it also has accompanied me for a very, very long time. I can also trace it back into the 1980s for sure. Uh, now, in terms of my contemporary work, I'm also a philosopher of science and a philosopher of what I call techno science and philosopher of technology. And so my contemporary interest is actually, in some sense, also to figure out how Wittgenstein's reflection on language and meaning and forms of life uh, are related to uh, questions in the philosophy of technology. Wittgenstein, of course, was an engineer by training, but he hasn't actually spent a lot of time thinking about technology as such. Still, there is a question how one can transfer his thoughts or how they relate to questions of technology. That is one, one uh, interest. The other one would be uh, people often distinguish between two different phases or stages in the thinking of Wittgenstein, the early and the late, they say in the middle. Now they have sort of discovered the middle Wittgenstein too, and there are several of those. So, um, uh, but uh, if you're talking about the early and the late Wittgenstein, I'm certainly one who has been mostly focused on the so-called early Wittgenstein. I think that might be a difference uh, to, to Jim. To some extent, I think Jim is right to say that you're more interested in the middle and the late, and I'm more interested in the early. Can one say that? I'm not sure. Um, Maybe so far, although I'm working on a historical commentary on the Tractatus now, so... Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I, I've never tried to draw a, a sharp distinction between early and late. I know you don't either, yeah. but um, I'm interested in... I would say one of the things that drew me into uh, my work on Wittgenstein was being interested in the man himself and his life and uh, uh, how that connected up with this philosophy. And although, obviously, there were... Uh, changes over time in his philosophical thinking. Um, I think there are also important continuities, and so I uh, tend to look at those also.
I agree on the continuities, but I will make one one footnote to what you just said. Uh, I've also been thinking about Wittgenstein's life and relationship to Wittgenstein's work, and uh, actually you invited me to do so in one of your collection of papers. But uh, as opposed to you, perhaps I'm not sure again, I'm trying to kind of create some some beginnings of a discussion here. Uh, 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 the, um, uh, I'm also fascinated and int intrigued by the person Wittgenstein, but I'm also a bit suspicious of using his biography and uh, and his, uh, in some sense, also personal interests and maybe even obsessions uh, as, a, as a kind of cue or clue to understanding Wittgenstein. So I do actually always try to say, okay, let's focus on the written text when it comes to, and the, and the text that he wanted to be published and that he wanted to be seen and not really to read, to project too much into that. Well, I want to talk about his uh, early life uh, factually first, but Wittgenstein is one of those people in the sciences or the, the arts or, or the humanities that has a uh, the detritus of myth about him, um, you know, uh, just the way, not to the degree maybe that Nietzsche does, but uh, uh, just in looking over, I'm not, I'm not a celebrity watch, I'm not a, a gossip hound or anything, so I just sort of knew him as uh, by a, a few major points in his life, just looking over before the show, uh, looking over his uh, life. There seems to be a number of myths, and I want to talk about that before we get to what was actually real. And uh, I guess the first one is that it seems to me that uh, he's always been painted as sort of an oddball. I did uh, prior shows in, in this series on Popper and uh, Bertrand Russell, both of whom, which uh, uh, Russell was a, a mentor of him and Popper was a vocal critic of him. Uh, and it seems that Wittgenstein today might be described as almost autistic. He seemed to have these odd little uh, quirks. Uh, there's a famous story that he he built his family a home and he he, he, he obsessed all the details, raising a roof a little bit just to get it right, spending months upon months designing uh, minor little door handles and stuff. Do you think that uh, uh, that bears any scrutiny if you're doing a biography that he was maybe autistic or a, a little bit wacky uh, personally? Either one of you. Go ahead, Alfred. Alfred, you can, <laughs> you can try okay. that I'll try. I'm not actually sure whether I'd describe him as wacky. I mean, he had some very decided principles. Uh, he had some very decided ideas about uh, what it mean, what it mean, what it might mean to be a good person, uh, and uh, and he had some. Uh, in some sense, he was a very modern thinker and uh, caught up in the uh, in the also contradictions of modernity, um, and he. Uh, he uh, looked for a kind of purity, perhaps you might say it, uh, and this is a different kind of obsession than being autistic. Uh, so, um, and the purity, of course, expresses itself in the door handle and the kind of perfect proportions of the house, and also in the kind of logically pure language that he envisioned in his early work. Uh, and he was kind of struggling with this ideal for purity, and uh, and in some sense. You might say he's uh, he's also struggling with the legacy of a uh, kind of magical thinking that haunts uh, our our thinking about mind and language, and he uh, he's still coming to terms with this even in his later work. So I think I would see him as a kind of radical modernist uh, who, but a nineteenth century modernist, um, and we might talk about that later in relationship to art and and uh, and music and so on. But um, uh, and um, and uh, he, oh, sure, I mean, some of his ideas are also deeply embedded in his family and the culture of Vienna in the late 19th century and so on. So uh, so I, I think we can make sense of all, even of his idiosyncrasies uh, uh, and his sort of almost uh, uh, weird uh, uh, insistence on being pure. How about you, James? What are your comments on that? Um, Almost 20 years ago, I organized a conference here at Virginia Tech on Wittgenstein about the relationship between his life and his philosophy, and Alfred was part of that. He mentioned that. But another one of the participants was a psychiatrist named Louis Sass, who teaches at Rutgers, and his paper was about how uh, he diagnosed Wittgenstein as having a schizoid personality, which by which he did not mean schizophrenic, but I guess in psychiatry, schizoid has a a certain special meaning having to do with the kinds of things that you're referring to. So it's not uh, considered to be the same thing as autistic, but um, 
it's a kind of personality that might be associated with philosophers generally often, and Wittgenstein perhaps takes it to an extreme. Yeah, um, I, I've recently I've been uh, reading up and listening to a lot of the music of Beethoven, and it, it struck me that Wittgenstein almost seems to be sort of the Beethoven of modern philosophy. He, he sort of defines the idea of uh, what we think of as a philosopher, someone who's a bit odd, someone who's prone to these great leaps this way and that way, and, you know, just the way Beethoven sort of defined that as sort of the musical genius. Uh, do you think that's a fair uh, rendering of his personality? Because he seems to have been very tempestuous in his dealings with, you know, whether it was the baker or the candlestick maker even. Um, I'll, I'll leave the comparison to Beethoven to Alfred, but, it, you know, it's true that he had a difficult personality and uh, was sort of infamous for that around Cambridge. Well, again, I mean, I'm not sure again about the Beethoven contrast, uh, and uh, and people have talked about the duty of genius in, re in relationship to Wittgenstein. That's actually the title of one of the biographies, um, and and a really good and readable one. Uh, but um, uh, did he think of himself as a genius? Not at all. Uh, I, 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 I mean, that's actually part of his his struggle to kind of understand himself as one who is very much a product of other people's thinking. He very much doubted his own originality. Uh, uh, and if there is originality in his work, it's really this constant uh, negotiation, this constant dialogue, this constant questioning of certain assumptions, uh, pictures, uh, uh, worldviews, or, or notions of mind and language that he's confronting. Uh, and he, he himself would say that, uh, that he is not, an, in, in that sense, an inventive philosopher who comes up with a doctrine or, uh, or a thesis or a new way of understanding life and world. Uh, in order to sort of facilitate uh, better conversations in these interviews, I often uh, try not to overstudy something that I don't know of. If we were talking about poetry or, or something that's sort of in my wheelhouse, uh, I already know the stuff, and I, as I, I stated, you know, I know a, a lot of the, the four or five major points about uh, uh, this philosopher, that philosopher, and in looking at, at online at some of his uh, biographical stuff, another major, uh, what seems to be probably apocryphal, but is that uh, he did go to the same school as Adolf Hitler, he was a year or two apart, and uh, some people have sometimes uh, claimed that uh, uh, Wittgenstein himself, if they had met uh, was sort of almost the archetypal Jew that that Hitler would have grown to hate later on. He came from a wealthy family. He was, I guess, this sort of uh, bon vivant that uh, could do whatever the hell he wanted. And uh, is there any truth to that? Do you think that they did meet? And again, this is just uh, trying to sort the myth from the, the reality. Uh, and and what what do you think if that they had met? Did or you know would Hitler have even known he was a Jew? Because uh, the name doesn't really suggest it. Well, I don't know, Jim. I'm sure you have a response to that. I will just quickly say that, uh, from what I what I gather about Wittgenstein's life and his family's life, uh, if they did meet, which I find questionable, uh, uh, Wittgenstein and uh, would not have been seen as a Jew because he himself didn't see himself as a Jew for quite a long time. His whole family was actually rather surprised and even shocked to find out that they were supposedly Jewish when uh, the Nazis started uh, asking for these uh, kinds of uh, uh, evidences of their of their background. So there is actually kind of mildly anti-Semitic strain in, in Wittgenstein's own uh, 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 own own thinking, and he is also coming to terms with that. That's actually one of the f the more interesting myths. Again, the myth about the person who's trying to be pure, that is the myth when he goes around uh, Cambridge confessing to his friends that he has sort of kept them in the dark about his Jewish uh, uh, ancestry and uh, and made most of his English friends didn't actually think it was such a big deal to be uh, to be in the dark about that <laughs> because they didn't think it mattered a whole lot uh, but he himself thought it was extremely important to set the record straight with them uh, uh, but this is again in the in the in the wake of uh, being somewhat shocked himself that he's suddenly from the point of view of the Nazis considered Jew well, let's uh, then get to some of the realities of his growing up. Um, just looking at uh, 
an overview of his ancestry. It seems that uh, he did come from some wealth, not not the wealthiest, but certainly from, uh, you could say, the upper class. Uh, and, uh, you know, I guess you'd call him upper class bourgeoisie. Uh, what sort of life did he grow up into? I know several of his uh, family members committed suicide. Was this an overly intellectualized family? Were they cold uh, and indifferent to each other? What, was there a history of mental illness? Let me start with you, James. <laughs> That's a lot of different questions there. Uh, I think his family probably was one of the richest families in Central Europe. His father uh, was in manufacturing and probably arm armaments manufacturing. Um, uh, his father and his mother were both very culturally uh, engaged, and uh, it's uh, said that they had Brahms as a household visitor and people like that. Uh, Biggie Shine bragged to somebody later that there were seven grand pianos in his house. Um, uh, Wittgenstein's father commissioned a portrait of one of his sisters by Klimt uh, for her marriage. Uh, one of his sisters was uh, apparently psychoanalyzed by Freud. So the family was very connected uh, culturally as well as very well off financially. Um, I think probably their father was a, a cold, demanding father. I think that probably had to do with the suicide of a couple of his brothers. Uh, I think maybe the father had learned his lesson a little bit and gave Wittgenstein a little bit more room to uh, go in the direction that he wanted to than he had with, with other brothers. Alfred, what, what are your thoughts on the youth? I mean, I would quite agree with that. I mean, there's actually quite a bit out there now about Wittgenstein's relationship to his family, especially his his sister and all the, there's a lot of correspondence available to us. Uh, and uh, and it's hard to, 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 uh, to, uh, to understand exactly uh, how families worked in the late 19th and early 20th century. But it seems to me that actually he and his family had a fairly good rapport and, and, and under, they understood each other very well. They knew quite well how to take each other, um, and uh, including the kind of impatience that they would have on occasion. But, uh, uh, but it seems that, uh, that uh, um, for all the ages in Christie's, um, uh, this was a, not a terribly dysfunctional family. Uh, he was born in a country that no longer exists, I believe, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, right? Uh, so, and uh, was his family, were they, you know, monarchists? Were they uh, syndicalists? Were, you know, what was the political milieu that grew up dominating his youth? Uh, James, you want to go? Oh. I, I, I don't really know all that much. Um. Alfred, do you know anything about that? Well, about his family's political background, I think they were actually quite, quite different. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, I, but I'm not actually entirely sure. I mean, Wittgenstein himself uh, was, I don't think, a terribly political person. Uh, I mean, he he sympathized at some point, in some ways, with the Soviet, uh, 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 with the Soviets, and um, and uh, and was thinking of actually uh, moving to uh, to Russia. But uh, I'm not sure whether that was actually politically or ideologically motivated. And uh, and the and his father and his brothers and his sister, they actually learned to be on quite uh, good terms with the Nazi regime. I mean, they actually, uh, even though um, the, uh, the Nazi uh, regime uh, sort of identified them as Jews, uh, they learned how to play with their wealth in a, in a, in a, in a productive way to keep themselves protected. So... Um, so they, uh, I think there was, if anything, a kind of a, a good sense of the bourgeois life, being uh, being uh, members of a of society, uh, 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 but without any very strong political inclinations. I think in one direction or another. Now, it's, go, oh, go ahead. going back to World War One, uh, when uh, the war broke out, Wittgenstein was actually in Vienna at that time, and he had been working practically as a hermit in Norway on his philosophy before then, and his first inclination was to go back to Norway, but he realized he wasn't going to be allowed to do that. And so he volunteered for uh, uh, the Austro-Hungarian army. In fact, he could have, he had already uh, been given a medical deferment because uh, of a, a medical condition. So there was no need for him to join, but he did join 
uh, his uh, sister said that she was sure it wasn't for patriotic reasons, but for spiritual reasons, uh, trying to you know put himself to the test, so, so to speak. But uh, he obviously you know was patriotic enough to participate in uh, you know significant fighting for uh, uh, four years. I mean, he he spent the whole he was in the war the whole time. He was decorated several times. So it was a significant experience for him, and in fact. Uh, when it seems appropriate, I want to go back to that because Alfred said he wanted to read Wittgenstein's writings without reference to their background, and I, I feel like the Tractatus is one thing you absolutely cannot read without knowing some of that background. Well, let's uh, talk about, uh, it was mentioned, uh, his faith. Uh, you know, he was ethnically from a Jewish background, but he was baptized, I, I think, a Roman Catholic. Uh, what was uh, his youth like, say, with his studies, and was he, uh, did he regularly, was he, did he take communion regularly, that kind of thing? Uh, what what was his ideas growing up? Uh, uh, Alfred, if you want to go first this time. Well, uh, I mean, this is a huge topic, and I think Jim knows a lot more about it right. than I do. But uh, I will give you my very quick uh, impression or my overall uh, assessment about his r religious life or his spirituality in the sense of uh, religious life. Uh, so there's on the one hand this quest for purity that I already mentioned, which is at the same time a, 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 a quest to, um, or it's informed by, by, by a strong sense that, um, uh, and it actually comes also from the philosophy of Schopenhauer, who is very important there, uh, a strong sense that there is something wrong, maybe even something I wouldn't use the word evil, but uh, there's something wrong about wanting to impose your will on the world. Um, so there is a strong sense that a really good person would be the kind of person who would, uh, uh, would in some sense, let go and accept the work for what it is and as it is. This is a motif that comes back repeatedly also in his philosophical writings uh, that he says uh, philosophy has to leave things as they are. Uh, so to accept things to, uh, as they are, that is in, in an important sense a kind of spiritual attitude which, however, requires a sacrifice. It requires a sacrifice of the will, first of all, but also the sacrifice of the intellect. And both of these Wittgenstein was never able to pull off. I mean, he himself thought badly of himself for that. <laughs> uh, he chastised himself for that, but he was not able to sacrifice his intellect, and which is actually, of course, one way to say he was not able to actually believe. Um, he tried to, so to speak, <laughs> and he thought he might be a better person if he could, but I don't think he actually... Alfred? Okay, you faded there just for a moment. But uh, James, if you want to continue, uh, thoughts on his uh, religious uh, beliefs? I don't think he ever participated in uh, formal religious uh, uh, activities. He certainly didn't belong to a church. Uh, I don't know that he ever uh, took communion, except perhaps maybe at the very end of his life. I'm not sure about that. Um, but when he was fighting in World War I, if you read his personal, di personal diaries, he is calling on God all the time for, uh, you know, out of concern about his safety and concern about his, uh, uh, his spiritual well-being. So uh, at least it, during the First World War and I think again uh, in the 1920s and again at times in the 1930s, he was uh, very much engaged with a, with a kind of search for God, but it didn't have any kind of formal uh, formal connection to the church. Well, let's talk about uh, the education. Um, he did go to Cambridge. I mentioned that uh, he uh, had known and was, I guess, influenced early on by uh, Bertrand Russell. Uh, what was did? How did his background inform some of his initial early beliefs? What effect did someone like Russell have on him or anyone else who was uh, an early mentor or uh, leading light for him? Uh, let me start with you again, James. Uh, yeah. Well, Russell, Russell certainly was a, a, an intellectual mentor and uh, 
the kinds of projects that Wittgenstein was interested in were basically Russell's projects of trying to uh, understand the foundations of mathematics and um, uh, trying to find a, a, a basis for mathematics and logic. And then, um, so the project that Russell was working on, uh, you know, around 1910 or 1911, uh, and then Wittgenstein uh, met Russell and started studying with him in 1911, I think Wittgenstein did take on a lot of the project that Russell was was working on. So he certainly was an intellectual mentor. Um, I think right from the start, Wittgenstein and Russell uh, were very different spiritually, uh, and um, I think that made it difficult for Wittgenstein to work with Russell, at least. Go ahead, Albert. Yeah, maybe I will correct, uh, not correct, compliment with, uh, on my view, uh, when Wittgenstein met Russell, Wittgenstein was in many ways philosophically a fully formed personality. Uh, so he uh, picked up a lot of philosophical influences and, uh, and intuitions from his earlier education. So uh, this was uh, was in yeah. I would just refer to the wonderful book of Wittgenstein's Vienna by by Yannick and uh, also reflected in that biography that I mentioned earlier by Ray Monk on the duty of genius. So he was already, uh, I think, under the influence of the philosophy of Schopenhauer on the one hand, but also um, uh, the, uh, the, philo the the philosophical thinking in kind of the century Vienna. Uh, people like Karl but also like Boylston and Hertz. And then he went to Berlin and studied to become an engineer. Uh, and again, during his engineering studies, he was confronted with other philosophical forms of uh, reflection about engineering, the logic of the machine, and so on. So I met Russell, and that's where I fully agree with what Jim When he met Russell, he, in some sense, encountered in Russell the representative of uh, uh, the, the contemporary problems of philosophy, and then he applied himself to that, mostly in a critical spirit, of course, and uh, and that's why it was very hard to get along with Russell, because in a sense, in the end, he didn't agree with much of what Russell was doing, but uh, he took up the project that Russell was engaged in, and uh, and and on, that was sort of, in some sense, the reflection where they met, and where Russell, of course, did appreciate very much uh, uh, intelligence and, and, uh, and talent. Well, uh, before we talk about... Uh, I, oh, I agree with what Alfred said. I agree with what Alfred said, and I think that shows why we've been able to work together so well over many years. <laughs> well, before we talk about the Tractatus and uh, uh, his main uh, ideas, let me just uh, one personal point. Uh, uh, he was, uh, Wittgenstein, it seems, was bisexual, or was he homosexual in the closet? And how do you think that uh, his homosexuality if in any way affected his ideas? Uh, you know, you know, I mean, nowadays we think with all this identity art and stuff that it had to have some profound effect. But from what I can see, it doesn't seem to have had any real effect on his ideas. That just seems to have been, that's what he was. Um, would you agree with that? And if not, uh, or, or do you have this more modern idea that sexuality or identity is imminent in everything that a person does? Uh, let me start with you, Alfred. You look ready to go. Okay, all right. Uh, well, I'm actually reminded of, uh, of a movie about Wittgenstein by... Um, Maker Norman, who made a really interesting film about... We had some little technical problems here with Skype. We were talking about, or oh, you were talking about the Derek Jarman film about Wittgenstein. What was your point regarding that? Exactly. The point was twofold. First of all, Wittgenstein's home section really doesn't play out in his philosophy. So in his philosophy, we don't see traces of it. But at the same time, it, that his view of language, I mean, which is his philosophy, especially his early philosophy, is exactly the kind of closet within which uh, homosexual is in some sense hidden. Because his view of language doesn't really allow for any like expression of the inner self in, uh, uh, making the inner His view of language is very much one which deals with the ways in which coordinate each other in a public way through language. 
So it is one that that ultimately makes homosexuality impossible. This is uh, pretty much a point that is made in the film. Wittgenstein's homosexuality reveals something hidden and unexpressed, and that is actually be part of it, that the purity of language is also a, a, a way of making building himself a kind of ideal kind of closet for his homosexuality. Well, let me ask uh, James, do you agree with that, or do you have any other view on uh, his uh, private life? Yeah, I think, uh, in general, Wittgenstein's sexuality was just a problem for him. I don't think he, uh, he wasn't um, homosexual particularly. He was engaged to be married to a woman at one time, um, and then he had uh, a couple of relationships with uh, men who were a good deal younger than him, but I think he always felt a great deal of discomfort about the nature of his sexuality. Um, but I, I agree with Alfred, I don't think that it plays out in his philosophy. Uh, I've written a book about, uh, I've written two books about Big and Shine, and I didn't find any need to mention his sexuality in either of those books. Well, let us talk about uh, his ideas then. In his lifetime, he only published one book, uh, the Tractatus uh, Logico Philosophicus, uh, and it's a very uh, small book. Uh, what do you think uh, accounts for uh, its endurance uh, uh, in regard to his reputation uh, and you know, versus later stuff? I mean, uh, was it something that was revolutionary? Was it something that's revolutionary but now seen as passe? Uh, is it there? Is it still relevant? Let me start with you, James. Uh, give me your take on that work and, and why it has such an inordinately large uh, impact on our views of him. Um. I don't have any simple answer to that question. Um, it, there is the, the fact that Wittgenstein had two important philosophical works, the Tractatus uh, that was published in 1921 and the Philosophical Investigations that was published shortly after his death in 1953. There's a sense in which the Philosophical Investigations is the more famous of the two, I guess. Um, um, and I think for... 20 or 30 years after its publication, it was maybe the more influential of the two. I think the way philosophy is done now, uh, uh, analytic philosophy is done, probably uh, philosophers find more to look back to in the Tractatus than they do to look back to in the philosophical investigations in terms of how analytic philosophy is done now. Um, as for why it's uh, got the reputation that it does, I don't know, it's uh, very uh, uh, almost impenetrable um, it doesn't really explain itself very well and so I think that this makes it sort of attractive to some kinds of people um, who you know feel like there's uh, something prophetic in it and if only they could figure out what it is and so Wittgenstein sort of feeds that feeling at the end with some comments about mysticism and I think that uh, adds to its uh, uh, obscure reputation also. I, I was saying earlier that um, I think the Tractatus is, one of, uh, is a book that you can't really appreciate without knowing some of the biographical background, at least in my opinion, especially the passages near the end of the book. In, in my view, his experience, he was writing this while he was fighting at World War I, and while he was trying to deal with things like his own uh, his own life being in danger and so forth. And uh, he was keeping a personal diary during that time as well as a philosophical diary. And I think you can uh, almost um, connect, I mean, you can connect passages in the personal diary with things that he was writing philosophically at the time. And uh, so, so he makes statements in the Tractatus that are very hard to understand in their own right, but I think make a lot more sense when you understand what he was dealing with himself um, at that time. Go ahead, let me try. Uh, let me try to answer the same question. Uh, what makes this um, book so the the early book, the first, the Tractatus? What makes it so influential? And I think the shortness of it has a lot to do with it right there. I mean, it's written in a kind of aphoristic way, uh, uh, very short remarks. Uh, uh, but secondly, I mean, he makes a claim in the preface, which is the claim that it solves the problems of philosophy in some sense forever, right? This is the solution. I mean, actually, Wittgenstein followed up on that by 
stopping to be a philosopher, right? I mean, this was, um, uh, and this was a, an attempt of his, for his whole life to say, you know, let's see whether we can answer the problems of philosophy, or, or at least make them go away, uh, or, uh, or, or liberate ourselves from them. So we don't have to be plagued by these kinds of problems. And in many ways, uh, this is what the Tractatus stands for. And I think it makes even a credible, uh, a credible claim to having solved the problems of philosophy once and for all, given what Wittgenstein considered to be the problems of philosophy, I mean, which is maybe, you might say, a narrow vision of what these problems are. But, uh, but uh, if they concern the relationship of language and world, right, you might say, here's the complete picture, and beyond that there's really nothing, nothing to be said. He himself argues that having solved the problem of philosophy is not a huge achievement, because he didn't think that philosophy was all that important. I mean, that is all in the production already to the, to the Tractatus. So this kind of ambiguous claim, that reappears at the end of the Tractatus, but I think it's already interesting in the beginning, that on the one hand, philosophy is not such an important enterprise and that solving all the problems of philosophy is not such a big deal. Uh, and on the other hand, having solved them once and for all, that is a kind of provocation, I think, uh, uh, which uh, invites people, of course, uh, to to retrace those steps. And some are more drawn to the solutions that he offers, some are more drawn to the, the the big gap that lies beyond philosophy that he's also trying to identify. Well, what is his relationship with uh, what would be called logical positivism? Was he m mainly an empiricist? Was he someone who was sort of off in the areas of thought more often? Was there... Uh, a, a consequence to things that he thought about? Was, was he grounded in the material? Uh, where, where, where does he stand in relation to his milieu then, uh, James? Well, the, as Alfred said, after, after he published, after the war was over, um, he decided to become an elementary school teacher, and so he left all of that behind. In fact, he left the the, his manuscript unpublished. He left it to Russell to get it published because he had, hadn't been able to find a publisher himself. So um, he, he left philosophy, but when it was published, it was discovered by people in Vienna uh, who came to form the so-called Vienna Circle, who were very uh, scientifically oriented philosophers. And in reading the Tractatus, they felt like they had found uh, the uh, statement of their philosophy. Uh, and so uh, the Tractatus was studied in Vienna very early on, maybe just a year or so after it was published. And the people who were reading it, the, the people that would become the Vienna Circle, wanted to meet Wittgenstein. Uh, he was off in the countryside for several years, but eventually he did come back to Vienna, and that's when he helped design the house for his sister that you mentioned earlier. And it was during that time that uh, he did agree to meet with uh, people from the Vienna Circle occasionally. Um, in terms of your, your uh, question about whether these are myths about Wittgenstein or truths about Wittgenstein, at any rate, there are stories that uh, he would meet with the members of the Vienna Circle, but when they wanted to ask him about the Tractatus, his reaction was to turn his back to them and read poetry. And uh, in a way, that might have been his way of showing uh, uh, what things uh, uh, can only be shown and not said. Uh, in general, Wittgenstein felt like the, the people from the Vienna Circle didn't understand the, the points that were the most important points to him in the Tractatus. Uh, Alfred, let me ask you about uh, your views of at least the early Wittgenstein uh, and materialism and uh, you know, his relations with others. Well, I would agree with Jim that uh, I, without putting a very narrow label on his work, that it does appeal to uh, people who are interested in some sense the modern scientific worldview. Uh, the, the the Vienna Circle that Jim was referring to uh, was interested in what they would call a kind of scientific uh, 
worldview, uh, uh, what does a modern worldview consist in, and how does it rid itself of uh, uh, of metaphysical presuppositions? And uh, and uh, and again, I think you might put this under this heading of purity that I've been referring to a couple of times. So it's a very rigorous and uh, and um, in its own way perfectly consistent. Uh, a way of thinking about the relationship of language and world, which, however, of course, uh, leaves or circumscribes, you might say, it circumscribes a, 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 a place for agreement and agreement about facts of the world um, as one kind of small compartment, in some sense, of modern public life, and uh, and uh, and idealizes this as one where you might say something like communication, uh, uh, rational uh, agreement, disagreement is possible, uh, and uh, where you might uh, find an agreement, not just between theory and world, but also between my theory of the world, your theory of the world, right? So all of these things are, uh, are perfectly uh, modeled the idea of it's kind of, in some sense, you might say, scientific rationality and the scientific description of the world, uh, and and then there is a big rest, and the rest is uh, uh, is uh, you, uh, by Wittgenstein uh, uh, sort of left in the in in the sphere of silence or darkness, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it is not uh, uh, relegated into uh, the into something uh, that you might call the irrational, uh, uh, or it's, it is not. He does not dismiss it, uh, and uh, uh, but neither actually did the members of the Vienna Circle necessarily dismiss this. Uh, I think they also had a kind of respect for poetry and the arts and maybe uh, maybe metaphysics and spirituality. But it had nothing to do with public life. Public life and public uh, reasoning, and public understanding, had to, in some sense, be restricted to this very modernist conception. Of, uh, of, uh, of how to produce sentences that can agree or disagree with the facts and that are subject to our forms of agreement and disagreement. And that's all that we can, in some sense, uh, uh, trust upon or, uh, or, or work with uh, in, a, in a kind of public way. And everything else is, in some sense, elusive uh, and, uh, and has to be subjected to a kind of skepticism about language. Well, there was about uh, uh, three decades at the end of his life from the publication of Tractatus uh, uh, until his death and his, his posthumous publication. Let's talk about a, a bit of that life, because these uh, this is some of the more tumultuous times of uh, the 20th century, uh, the Great Depression, uh, World War II. Uh, what was he doing then? Was he constantly thinking? You said how he'd given up philosophy for a bit, went to become a teacher, tried to be an architect. Uh, was he just sort of bouncing around uh, like, the, the bourgeois want to do, or uh, what was he doing for those several decades? Well, he, he wasn't bouncing around the way the bourgeois want to do because he was uh, penniless, basically. Uh, when his father died just before World War I, uh, he uh, inherited his share of that fortune, which made him one of the richest men in, in Central Europe during World War I. But as soon as the war was over, Wittgenstein took step, legal steps to ensure that he not have any of that inheritance, and uh, all of it went to his uh, siblings, and he uh, didn't want to be burdened <laughs> with uh, wealth. And so uh, when he was teaching in uh, rural Austria, when he was uh, working uh, on the house for his sister, he was being paid, I suppose, minimum wage, more or less, during those, during those times. So he, he wasn't uh, financially well off. Uh, he did go back to Cambridge in 1929 because he finally, partly because of his meetings with the Vienna Circle, he started to think that perhaps there were uh, ways in which he uh, could come back to philosophy and had something new to contribute. So that's what brought him back. Uh, but he depended on either uh, his uh, meager earnings from Cambridge, or occasionally some support from John Maynard Keynes, who was a close friend of his, but he was always very reluctant to accept financial help from people. As far as I can tell, he wasn't affected by the, the Depression. Um, 
um, you know, he 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 had a, a a position at Cambridge, a sort of poorly paid position at Cambridge for most of the 1930s. Um, and uh, when World War II came around, he again felt the need to uh, volunteer. By this time, he was a British citizen. He had gotten that citizenship precisely to escape from the Nazis himself. Um, and uh, so during World War II, he worked as a, uh, in a, as a hospital aide and then uh, doing some research. Um, I think that's that's the kind of transition. He, he did most of the work on his uh, second book, the, the Investigations, during the 1930s while he was teaching or while he was uh, away on, on his own. Uh, Alfred, what are your thoughts on this uh, period between the two works? Um, yeah, again, it's, I also find it hard to describe it as a kind of political period. Uh, I, 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 when I look at Wittgenstein's life, uh, I would agree with, with Jim. He was reluctantly drawn back into philosophy. Maybe because he was becoming aware that his early pronouncement that he had solved all the problems of philosophy wasn't sufficient, at least wasn't sufficient to put his own mind to rest. I mean, this was always his criterion. I mean, uh, uh, you should try to kind of think about philosophical problems in such a way that you are not plagued by them or bothered by them anymore. And, uh, and clearly he still was bothered. And, uh, and, uh, and the problems, in some sense, came back to haunt him. And he found that he had, in, in some ways, concluded his, his work. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, this uh, later work is a different way to pacify his, uh, his, uh, his philosophical uh, worries and concerns and doubts and questions um, uh, than, uh, than his earlier work was. But it still is sort of revolves always around putting our mind to rest, showing that problems may be dissolved um, in, in, in a way that would allow him to escape towards a, a life that is actually perhaps a much more meaningful life than that of philosophy. He encouraged his, uh, his, his mentees and his friends uh, not to pursue philosophy careers. And again, he, as Jim was mentioning, he, uh, he, he looked at different ways to escape uh, also professionally again from from this from this predicament and from this from this world. So I, I see him more sort of motivated by that than by anything sort of external. I mean, clearly he was aware of uh, the political upheavals in his time, uh, but I don't see them in some sense motivating or playing into his his, bio, his philosophical biography. The way that you described it, Alfred, remind me of the, the third Godfather movie where Al Pacino says, just when I think I'm out, they pull me back in. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, I had mentioned that a number of his family members had committed suicide. Was his return, if you will, to philosophy motivated simply uh, by the uh, intellectual pursuits, or was there perhaps some uh, niggling knowing things uh, that were brought up by the fact that members of his family were suicidal, that this suicidal streak ran in the family. Uh, was was he ever like, for example, himself depressed or, and in, in uh, therapy or anything? <laughs> Jim, do you want to answer? Go ahead. <laughs> well, I don't think he was in therapy ever. Was he? Uh, I don't think he was. I mean, was no. he depressed? I wouldn't use that modern word, but he clearly... Uh, was aware that uh, this uh, there was a suicidal streak in the family and that he himself in some ways contemplated it i'm not sure whether he was ever close to it or not but uh, but he he in some sense he was aware that that uh, that his in this sense his was also a precarious existing existence i'm not sure whether he was deeply sad or depressed uh, but uh, uh, but uh, if he stayed in philosophy i don't see it I mean, there, there are some moments, and of course Jim and I have worked on that, um, there are some moments where one feels that, that the kind of uh, philosophical pursuit, the, in, in the interest to pacify his own 
mind um, uh, have also something therapeutic for himself, but not in the sense of finding the kind of meaning, for example, that would allow him to continue living. I mean, this is not, I mean, he wasn't looking to a philosophy as a sort of meaning uh, of, of life, I mean, the way we might think of it sometimes. But, um, but the philosophical pursuit, perhaps, has in itself maybe something I don't know, soothing to the mind. I'm not sure entirely. Uh, Jim, I'm, I'm drifting away. You have to help me out here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have two things to say. One of them uh, is about this uh, question whether philosophy can sort of be uh, a significant factor in one's, the meaning of one's life. Um, it, during World War I, um, uh, one of his brothers named Paul uh, was was a pianist, and in fact, I, I believe he had a, a fairly impressive career as a pianist uh, before the war began. And uh, during the course of the war, he, he lost his right arm. And uh, when Wittgenstein learned about this, I think this happened fairly early on in the war, when Wittgenstein learned about this, he wrote in his private diary, what kind of philosophy would one need to get past this? Uh, and uh, that, I think, is the only time that I recall Wittgenstein using the word philosophy in that sense as something that would allow you to, you know, give you uh, some sort of consolation or guidance or something like that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, though, is uh, this question of whether he was uh, happy or unhappy, depressed, suicidal. He certainly was or claimed to be suicidal many times in his life, but the occasion I wanted to highlight was the very end of his life. Um, he had cancer and uh, he knew that he was uh, dying. He had been taking uh, anti-cancer drugs. And, uh, at, at a certain point he decided to stop that because it was uh, 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 making him feel mentally confused. And uh, so uh, he stopped taking the drugs and he went to live with his doctor uh, and was cared for by the wife of his doctor. And the, the night before he died, they knew he was close to death, and they had contacted his friends to let them know that they should come and see him if they could. And so uh, Mrs. Bevan, the wife of the doctor, said to, Vic, said to Wittgenstein, your friends are on their, on their way. Uh, they'll probably be here soon. And Wittgenstein is supposed to have said, tell them I had a wonderful life. And those were his litter. Those were on his his deathbed. I don't know if they were quite his dying words, but he didn't say anything after that anyway. And uh, the next morning, he had passed away. And so his friends were told about this. Uh, Tell them I've had a wonderful life. Uh, and I think they all puzzled about what he could possibly have meant. Uh, Norman Malcolm, one of his students, was the first one to report this uh, statement in a publication, and uh, Malcolm. Uh, couldn't understand what he might have meant by this, um, um, and in a in a second edition of his uh, of the memoir that Malcolm wrote, he, he came back to it again and and felt that maybe there was a sense in which he had accomplished something, you know, worth accomplishing, and in that sense, um, it had been a, a worthwhile life. Uh, the, the word "wonderful" really was a kind of odd word choose for him uh, uh, someone that I uh, worked with many years ago conjectured that by wonderful Wittgenstein here meant full of wonder and um, I think that is a plausible conjecture although the English word wonderful really doesn't support that interpretation but since Wittgenstein wasn't a native English speaker maybe maybe for him wonderful did sort of embody that uh, because there is a, a good, um, which I say, a uh, uh, path through Wittgenstein's life in which he talked about the value of wonder and how science tended to uh, undermine our sense of wonder and how it was important to him to uh, maintain a, uh, a notion of, of wonder. So I don't know what to say about that, but it, it was an in, it was an interesting statement on his part uh, of his life. I think, in a way, uh, it gives lots of different people opportunities to read into it what they might. What did, what did you think about that line, Alfred? Well, I'm actually also I'm 
sort of torn between these different interpretations and uh, and uh, but actually from what you said I would rather come back to the first part of your story the one about his brother Paul right so when he asks uh, how what kind of philosophy might you need to sort of uh, sort of work through this catastrophe of being a pianist who loses an arm uh, and actually Paul in some sense does give the answer and the answer is not a philosophical doctrine, but is actually, uh, in some sense, a way in which one pursues one's life. And I think that is a very important theme in Wittgenstein, that he believes that you cannot express yourself in language, but there are all kinds of ways in which you can express yourself in the life you lead. Uh, uh, you cannot express values in language, which is one of the main limitations of language, right? But you can express values through the life you lead. And uh, and Paul, when he left, he lost his arm. The first thing he did is he never stopped being a pianist. Uh, even during his years, in, uh, uh, he was a prisoner of war, and he was not even close to piano. He used his left hand constantly to practice on a kind of imagined piano in his in his prison cell. And after he was uh, and after he was released, he would use his enormous wealth. This is we are talking about Paul Wittgenstein to commission the most important composers of the 20th century to write for him concertos for the left hand, which didn't keep him, by the way, from rejecting many of those compositions and saying that they were just awful music and he would play them and so forth and so on. He would not, and, and so the whole point is one of, in some sense, staying true to yourself and a, uh, and, 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 and a sense of duty, perhaps, that, that comes from that. And I think this is also a predominant motive in Wittgenstein when we call him eccentric, idiosyncratic, autistic, whatever, right? I think there is a very, very important imperative to stay in some ways true to yourself, especially since you have no other way to express who you are or what your values are. I believe Alfred was the person who had uh, delineated early and, and later, and I think James was the one who said that, that he didn't see that uh, distinction. So let's talk about uh, the the uh, work that was published afterwards, the, uh, the one that's also uh, quite well-known, Philosophical Investigations. And uh, um, was there a, a turn? I mean, does uh, what is there a uh, is there a significant difference in what he proposes uh, and what is proposed uh, in the posthumous work uh, that either elaborates or contradicts the earlier work? Uh, let me start with you this time, Alfred. All right. Uh, well, <laughs> as we were saying earlier, uh, there are different views about this. I mean, some philosophers and historians of philosophy have actually treated. Wittgenstein as if he were two people, the early Wittgenstein, the late Wittgenstein, right? Russell actually did that in his history of Western philosophy, I think, uh, uh, or 20th century philosophy, where he, he said there were, you know, uh, just a few important philosophical views in the 20th century, and then there's the view of the first Wittgenstein, and then almost as a separate kind of view, that of the late Wittgenstein. Uh, I don't actually agree with that. I mean, I actually think that the, the basic intuitions and the basic motivation have stayed the same from the early to the late uh, philosophy. But of course, one of the things he, re he, he, he encounters in his later thinking, uh, which is something that he didn't even uh, really uh, deal with at all in his early philosophy, is the, the question of how do the things we say relate to what supposedly we mean. There is a notion here that there is not just sentences that we utter and that have a meaning because of because the symbols we use and the kind of uh, uh, thing a sentence is, but that the sentences we utter uh, the, uh, and that we write down and supposedly relate in some ways to a kind of mental content, something that's in the brain first, right? Uh, uh, some kind of understanding, something that wants to be expressed. And and I think this is ultimately uh, a, a, a kind of relationship that Wittgenstein found very troubling. Um, uh, so what is the relationship of what we mean to what we say? Is there something that we mean behind what we say? And if we claim this, isn't this a kind of strangely magical or mystical notion in its own right? How do we rid ourselves of this conception that there is a kind of meaning behind what we say 
uh, can we rid ourselves of this conception? Doesn't it always come back in some ways? Uh, so this is, I think, a new set of questions, uh, and much of his later philosophy revolves around that. James? I guess I would highlight uh, two things. Um, in the early philosophy, in the Tractatus, Wittgenstein uh, focuses on what can be said and what he uh, he uses that term to, to refer specifically to uses of language that are basically descriptive, but that are like, sorts of things that can be true or false. And he thinks of language as representing the world or uh, uh, picturing the world is a term he uses sometimes. And uh, it, you'd sometimes get the feeling that for Wittgenstein in his early work, language sort of stands outside the world representing it. Um, and Wittgenstein, uh, in the early work, also said that there are lots of other things that are important, but they aren't things that can be said. They can only be shown, and so this distinction between showing and saying is a, an important one for him. And, in fact, that uh, sort of points to the, the closing proposition of the Tractatus, uh, proposition number seven, the infamous one that says that which we cannot speak about, we must, we must remain silent. Uh, in the later philosophy, in, in the philosophical investigations, I think there are two uh, ways in which it uh, moves past uh, the position in the Tractatus. For one thing, um, in the Tractatus, it talked about language only fun really only functioning in a descriptive fashion. And in the investigations, he sees that language can function in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, and so he now wants to acknowledge that which can describe, but it can command, it can uh, joke, it can um, uh, question. And so uh, where earlier he had said that uh, language uh, can only say or, uh, or implicitly show, now he thinks of a Really, most anything can be talked about, and this is uh, connected with his notion of language games. And so there, of course, is a language game of description and scientific description, but there's also a language game of religion or a language game of ethics. Uh, and so in this sense, the, the philosophical investigations broadens out uh, considerably compared to the Tractatus. And also, uh, his conception of language and in investigations is that language is part of the world and is part of life. So, whereas in the Tractatus, language had kind of st stood apart from life, reflecting or representing it, now in the investigations he sees language as part of life, uh, uh, engaged with it much more. So those are, those are two ways in which there is, you might say, a development from one to the other. Well, uh, let me talk then about uh, legacy uh, now here in the 21st century. Uh, and it, basically, I want to ask you both for two parts. One, uh, do you think his legacy is looked upon favorably or disfavorably? I know there have been critics uh, in the years since his death, uh, seven, almost seven decades. Uh, and uh, is there something that's been propagated about his ideas that has been woefully misrepresented or somehow misunderstood and would what would you say about that in terms of correcting that? So what is his legacy and, you know, uh, today favorable or not? And what has been uh, uh, somehow discombobulated about uh, what he said and what people take? Uh, let me start with you, Alfred. Well, that's a really, really difficult question because on the one hand, uh, it's, I think, beyond uh, doubt and beyond question that uh, Wittgenstein is considered to be one of the most, maybe the most important philosopher of the 20th century. And, uh, and in, 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 in very important ways, I think his legacy does continue. Uh, is it ever, has it ever become a kind of mainstream philosophical legacy? That's a very important and again, very difficult kind of question. Uh, I'm myself a philosopher of science uh, and, uh, and, uh, and of course the Vienna Circle that Jim was referring to earlier, the Vienna Circle that was very avidly interested in Wittgenstein uh, was also a, a major, a major um, force in what we call now philosophy of science. But the philosophers of science themselves do not refer to Wittgenstein uh, 
ever, you might just almost say. So uh, so he has been almost erased from the history of the philosophy of science, and, uh, and that I think is partly due to uh, suspicions about his so-called mysticism and uh, and uh, kind of deep irritation about his later work. When, when, you say, when you say mysticism, are we talking, when we think about that now, we talk about New Age, or are we talking about something that, uh, what we would talk about, uh, the difference, what we now would call qualia, that there, there are certain things that simply are beyond investigation. What do you mean exactly by that? Well, I mean, I think there are different ways to interpret this so-called mysticism, and we might want to talk about it some more. Uh, but uh, but uh, there was a time when, uh, when the readership between Wittgenstein was in some sense divided between those who took uh, what he contributed to what we now call the analytic tradition of philosophy uh, of clarifying uh, uh, the uses of language, maybe also with the help of logic and mathematics and, uh, and in a kind of rigorous way. And then there were other readers of Wittgenstein who were picking up on those statements in which he, uh, he intimated that there is something beyond the sayable, and that this uh, what is beyond the sayable has a kind of value and uh, and uh, and importance in its own right, and that in some ways, talking about what we can say is only a way of hinting or gesturing at this other uh, sphere of uh, of the mystical. And 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 of course, if you are a philosopher of science, if you come from the analytic tradition, you are deeply suspicious of anyone picking up that strand of, uh, of Wittgenstein's philosophy. And since you were asking about his legacy, I mean, this is partly what we are, what one has to deal with. But I think actually today in the 21st century, we are in some sense beyond that kind of division. We are not looking at those people who give mystical readings of Wittgenstein and those people who give analytic reasons, uh, readings, but we are, we are much more interested in, in, uh, in his, uh, in also, I think his place in 20th century culture. Um, so, uh, uh, the, there are many recent books that are trying to forge a connection between Wittgenstein and Heidegger, for example, philosophers who are in some ways very, very far apart, but you can tease out certain kinds of interests that they might have in common, uh, and, uh, and, and, and there's been considerable writing about that. We are also increasingly engaged in Wittgenstein scholarship in the sense of discovering texts that weren't published during his lifetime and, uh, and gaining new uh, new uh, kind of philosophical insights and puzzles from that. So there's, there's a very lively and, and, and active uh, reception of Wittgenstein. Is there a way in which he's completely misunderstood? Maybe I'll leave that for now to, to Jim. Uh, I actually would argue that it's important to, to, uh, to always revisit the rigor uh, and the sense of duty and, uh, and uh, trying to be truthful to, to yourself and, and, and not to say what cannot be said and all these kinds of things. This kind of rigorous aspect of Wittgenstein, I think it's important to keep that in mind uh, rather than to kind of soften them, him up too much. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, uh, but that's a very, very broad statement. I'm not even sure who I'm critiqu critiquing by saying that. Well, James, uh, Alfred just passed the basketball to you. Do you want to take a shot about that? Uh, I, I think there's pretty wide agreement that Wittgenstein was the most important philosopher in the 20th century. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, there was even a, a few polls done about this uh, by Brian Leiter, who's a, a philosophical blogger and has quite a following. And so the polls got quite a bit of uh, r response. Uh, Wittgenstein was... Uh, voted the most important philosopher of the 20th century, the most important philosopher of the 19th and 20th century. Uh, so far as the last 400 years, he only he only uh, trailed behind Kant, uh, uh, Descartes, and Hume. So he was number four. And then, so far as all time, he only uh, trailed uh, Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates. So he comes out number seven all time, which is uh, pretty amazing. But, I'm a little uh, surprised by Hume being up that high, but nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's a sense in which he's uh, that uh, means that he's been put on a pedestal yeah. uh, in you know the negative sense of that. I think that uh, people will or philosophers will acknowledge how important he was, but that he didn't have the same kind of um, impact on uh, current current philosophy that you might expect. Um, uh, 
a part of his impact, I think, comes from the fact that he had these two philosophies. Uh, and there's a way in which philosophy in the second half of the 20th century uh, uh, followed in those two paths. So there's the more scientific path uh, deriving from the, the Tractatus and the uh, logical positivists and the Vienna Circle. And then there's the more, uh, what has come to be called, I guess, ordinary language path uh, that uh, derived from the philosophical investigation. So, you know, uh, Wittgenstein was at the sort of source of both of these. And um, I think that partly accounts for how important he is. But in terms of the 21st century and whether he's um, misappreciated, um, uh, I think Alfred nodded toward me on that one because uh, I recently, or I guess it's now seven years ago, six years ago, published a book called Wittgenstein in Exile, and um, one of the uh, one of the implications of that metaphor is that he's not very um, uh, influential uh, just now. Uh, um, th there are other aspects of the metaphor that are important too, but just in terms of your question as to whether. Uh, that he's misunderstood. Um, I think he is in important ways, but of course uh, uh, other people uh, might disagree with me. But one of the things that I've tried to emphasize really through all of, uh, you know, I, I mentioned uh, that when I was getting tenure, I was publishing um, uh, articles on uh, moral philosophy and, and, and metaphysics, but the first a uh, paper I published on Wittgenstein is called Wittgenstein and Neuroscience. And uh, I've come back to that uh, topic uh, a few times over the years, uh, in, including uh, a, a book just came out uh, a couple months ago called Wittgenstein and Scientism. And I have a, an essay in that in which I uh, come back to these same sorts of issues. But I think there is a, a, a general feeling that Wittgenstein is a kind of I don't know if we should say op opponent of science, but in any case, that Wittgenstein sort of stands uh, uh, for a, 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 a completely conceptual approach to philosophy that ignores science, thinks that science has nothing to contribute to philosophy. And um, I would say contemporary philosophy tries to find ways that uh, science can contribute to and that uh, philosophy can be uh, responsive to science. And so, Wittgenstein has gotten a kind of reputation as being the the opponent here, the uh, the person who stands uh, for old-fashioned armchair way of doing philosophy. And uh, I think one way that Alfred and I are very similar is that we both have a, a deep appreciation for his engagement with science and his uh, thoughts about how science can be relevant. Uh, certainly. Uh, he, he was a well-trained scientist uh, uh, in engineering and, and things like that, and that certainly comes out in his uh, representational theory of language in the Tractatus. But what I want, what I've tried to emphasize, is that uh, Wittgenstein is very open to ways in which science can itself influence our conceptual scheme uh, through its developments. And uh, although I think some famous uh, interpreters of Wittgenstein now think of Wittgenstein as sort of having the idea that we have a conceptual scheme and nothing that science can do will ever influence that and uh, philosophy is really conceptual and so there's this very strong separation between the two whereas I think that there's a lot of evidence in Wittgenstein that he understands the ways in which our concepts can be molded by science and how that can have ultimately an impact on philosophy. Well, uh, I will link to both Alfred's and uh, James's uh, university web pages. Uh, in closing remarks, I do want to pick up though on uh, something you just said, James, was uh, you anticipated what I was going to ask next, so I'll let you uh, tackle this in your closing remark. Um, I was wondering uh, when you talked about neuroscience and Wittgenstein, I was wondering what effect or what influence he may have had on people like Chomsky and his descendants, uh, and also perhaps even people as far afield that people wouldn't recognize or relate it to, someone like even McLuhan. Um, the ideas about, uh, even if we go now to the modern idea of the meme, uh, as coined by Richard Dawkins, uh, do you think Wittgenstein sort of laid some groundwork for these uh, diverse uh, uh, explorations into the the mind and the the neurosciences as well. Uh, let me start with you, James. Well, 
I don't really know uh, the answer to Chomsky or McLuhan, but let me go back to science once more. One of the most Im one another very important uh, uh, influence in 20th century philosopher was, uh, philosophy was Thomas Kuhn in his work on the history of science. And uh, Kuhn is known to have been influenced by Wittgenstein's work on language games and forms of life. And so uh, Kuhn's conception of uh, the, the evolution and the history of, of science, I think, is very much influenced by Wittgenstein. And I, I will link actually to uh, this because I've done I've done shows on both McLuhan and uh, 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 Kuhn, and uh, I think that there are some connections people might want to do. So uh, thank you. And uh, let me just ask you, Alfred, if you uh, have any final thoughts, and do you have any thoughts about uh, what I mentioned uh, uh, about the neurosciences and Wittgenstein? Well, um, well, I do imagine that, especially McLuhan, and perhaps the idea of the meme might be in some ways influenced by Wittgenstein. Uh, I would go back to a statement that he makes in the Tractatus, where he, in some sense, compares religion and natural science. And this is one of those statements where he comes out to be a critic of science, it seems, it seems. Uh, and uh, the statement say, goes like this, roughly speaking, I'm only paraphrasing here. He says, uh, science gives you the illusion that it explains everything, or that it can explain everything. Religion refers to ultimately at some point you come to God as an ultimate explanation and he seems to say you know this is of course a bad explanation right I mean uh, but it is a more honest uh, explanation because it acknowledges that our explaining comes to an end and that there are no good explanations at some point uh, right? the, the when, whole infinite regression uh, thing right that yeah exactly but religion, if you once you got, get to to God as your last resort, right, you are in some sense being honest by saying, okay, there is no explanation. I'm putting in God as a kind of placeholder for this, mm. and and natural science produces the illusion that there's there's always yet another explanation, or that it can explain things fully. And and I think uh, Wittgenstein was always trying to exercise and get uh, get us to question these kinds of illusions of uh, of explanation and understanding. And this is especially true, I think, when it comes to questions of the mind. Uh, I mean, in, in many ways, I think he is one of the deepest skeptics about our ability to refer things to something mental. Right? Um, he doesn't deny that there are mental things <laughs> or that maybe there could be something like neuroscience, I'm not sure, but he, uh, but he, 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 he has a very deep skepticism about the possibility of in some ways progressing from what we say and maybe also even from what we do to something that is supposedly behind that and that is supposedly perhaps in the mind, in the brain, whatever, right? I mean, I think uh, this is a kind of skepticism that, that informs also his work on anthropology and so on. And, uh, and, uh, and I think this is also a very important maybe message we can take with us uh, when we read all these stories about uh, elucidating the mystery of the mind. If I can just pick up on uh, one of the things Alfred mentioned, uh, Wittgenstein many times says something equivalent to explanations have to come to an end some, somewhere, or explanations do come to an end somewhere. And of course that's a, a, a tautology, um, but I think what's interesting about Wittgenstein, especially in his later work, is that he often thought, he, he thought that explanations come to an end a lot sooner than most of us wish they would. And um, I think this was a way in which Wittgenstein probably does not fit with the sort of modern sensibility about how we can uh, push explanations further and further. And this does make him seem a kind of opponent of science. And in fact, uh, to come back to the, the metaphor from my book, Wittgenstein in Exile, one of the things that I talk about is how his worldview really is... Um, at odds with a very common world, contemporary worldview that you can push explanation further and further and Wittgenstein often and including in explanations of the mind or in investigations of the mind Wittgenstein thinks that our capacity to explain ends a lot sooner than we might have hoped and so this makes him uh, you know this I guess we could say this does in a certain sense put him at odds with a more uh, 
progressive or scientific or modern view of the world. Well, let's uh, end on that note. I will link to both Alfred's and James's uh, university pages. People can click there if they want to find out more about their writings. So thank you for spending uh, some time talking to me about Wittgenstein. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Good, good talking to you again, Jim. <laughs> yeah.